Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Well, that's a great note to start on. Let's just end now. You want to end on a high note always. Okay. Just for you, we're going to go ahead. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial, and the lucky guy who gets to be Michelle's co-host for her programs here at the club. Thanks for joining us today. Everyone here in the room, everyone watching and listening online. If you're joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 119-year-old nonprofit nonpartisan organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues. Any opinions expressed are those of the speakers. Now we're producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. In fact, when the pandemic struck, people were predicting we would do fewer programs. Last year, we actually did more programs than we've ever done in 119 years. Per year. Now we want to give a shout out of thanks to Trans Clinic for providing the coffee and treats before the program. The goodies came from fluid coffee and events. Now, most of you, I think, know how we do this. We have some question cards spread throughout the room. Throughout the program, if you have, to, if you have a question for our speaker, write it down. Wendy will pick up the questions cards and give them to me, and we'll work them into our discussion today. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors. Take it away, Michelle. today and those of you joining online thank you thank you I've not seen this many people at the club in a couple years so what a warm welcome back to 2022 our special guest today doesn't need that much of an introduction <laughs> after making history as the most successful woman to compete on Jeopardy with a 40 game winning streak and over <laughs> You didn't even wait for the like big stuff, you know? <laughs> the $1.3 million of prize money. <laughs> um, we're so excited to have you, Amy. But before we begin our program with John and I asking you some questions, we do have a gift for you to congratulate you on such a wonderful journey on Jeopardy. We have some flowers here from Transclinique. Oh. Hi. 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 Nice to meet you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. You want? Yeah. So the first question is actually going to come from the founder of Transclinic, Alexis Petra, who couldn't be with us today, but we have a video for you. Hi, I'm Dr. Alexis Petra, the founder and CEO of Transclinic. We're the first trans-owned and operated gender-affirming virtual clinic that was founded to serve uh, the trans and non-binary communities across the country by offering accessible telemedicine and on-demand hormone replacement therapy. We hope that you enjoyed today's treats by Fluid Cafe Co-op, Coffee by Us for All, and cookies from Crumble and Whisk. We're so proud and excited for Amy and her amazing success. To kick off today's program with Michelle and John, I'd like to ask the first question. Category is Women Jeopardy Champions. The question, the brilliant Jeopardy champion, Amy Schneider, played this song in her head before each taping started. What song was it? Back to you, Amy. Yeah, the song was uh, Lose Yourself by Eminem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, just, just the perfect, the, the lyrics were like really perfect for what I was trying to focus on, which was, uh, you know, like literally losing myself in the moment and not letting my mind be anywhere outside of on that stage um, and, you know, and, you know, thinking about those questions, not the cameras and not whatever else is going on in my life. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, here on the program, it is tradition that we start off with a coming out story. And so let's start there. Share your coming out story and what did William Shakespeare have to do with your coming out? <laughs> yeah, so you know, like any trans person in retrospect, it was obvious my whole life internally, but 
the moment that began my process of coming out was I was in Midsummer Night's Dream and I was playing Francis Flute, who is the rude mechanical and in the play within the play at the end, he's forced to play the female role. Uh, so I was putting on like a dress and wig and makeup every night and they were, you know, very silly. Uh, but it uh, kind of started, you know, I, I rem very, I'll always remember driving home on 880 after a rehearsal and just being like, what if I just dressed like that outside of the play? And it was just <laughs> like, I was like, wow, that feels good. Um, you know, and it, that was, you know, maybe like four or five years before I started actually, you know, before I actually kind of came out, but that's, that's what got the ball rolling. Okay, so Jeopardy, we mentioned in the green room, this was something you've been watching since you were five, but tell us how you came to be a contestant on it. How, when did you start pursuing it? How, did, how do you pursue being a contestant on it? Yeah, so I mean, as, as I said on the show, I was uh, voted most likely to be on in eighth grade. Um, and, you know, and I was, I was a cocky little kid and I, I agreed that I was gonna be on it someday, so it was kind of always in my plans. Um, and so yeah, I mean, I remember the first time I tried out was in, when I was still in Ohio and I moved to Oakland in 2009, so it's been at least that long. Um, and got to the last stage several times. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I you know, came out as trans and that at the time felt like it was the end of my plans to be on Jeopardy because I couldn't imagine being comfortable enough with myself to, to be on TV in that way. Um, but you know, that was kind of early transition thoughts as I settled into myself more. I realized that, you know, it was still out there for me and, and got back to trying out. And then in um, like the fall of 2020, I got the call that I was, you know, gonna be on the show and went down there, was in LA uh, on the, the day before the taping. And this was, uh, you know, very near the end of Alex Trebek's run. Um, and the day before the taping, they called and they were like, there were COVID issues, you know, with the union and we're not gonna be taping tomorrow. Uh, they canceled the next day as well. And they're like, okay, we're gonna reschedule you. So I went back to Oakland and uh, saw the news like a week later that, that Alex had passed and, you know, just they kept rescheduling and finally put me on hold for a while. And then it was a year later when they were like, okay, we're really stable now. We're, we're definitely gonna have you on this time, we promise. And, and I went down. What was the uh, the process? I mean, what what happens yeah. next? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the process starts with a, the online test, um, and then anybody who gets above a certain cutoff score, which they don't say, but people on the internet seem to think it's around forty two or forty three out of fifty, maybe maybe as low as forty. Out of all of those, they take a random sampling and invite them for an either in person back in the day or a, a Zoom audition. Um, and then you basically, you take another version of that same test to figure out whether you were cheating the first time. Um, and then they run everybody through some sort of mock Jeopardy games um, just to see, uh, partly, you know, are you kind of interesting to look out on camera? Do, do you have some personality? And also, especially, are you quick? Because they try to keep a really fast pace on the show. They want to get through all questions and they've got, I think I read 12 seconds per question and answer. So as soon as you, you know, give your response, they want you to immediately be like category dollar amount. And so that's, that's definitely one of the things they're looking for as well. Uh, and then in my experience, what would happen then is they'd be like, okay, everybody here, you're now in the active pool and in the next 18 months, you'll either get a call to be on the show or start over again. Um, so I had gotten to that last stage, I think three times. Um, yeah, so, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of time thinking it could be any day now and it not happening. Uh, but, you know, I'm really glad it took as long as it did. I mean, you know, for one thing, the, I, as I was always telling myself, well, I'm going to know more by the time it happens. <laughs> um, but, you know, I also like am indescribably glad that I didn't get on before uh, coming out um, to, you know, I think about having that memory and having that like, you know, seeing that as you know, my old self and it would have been so, you know, upsetting. And so I'm really, really thankful it took as long as it did. I mean, I would have been thankful if it took maybe a couple years less, but yeah. <laughs> we have some questions about the actual process of, of the taping. We were talking about this before the program as well. 
you tape multiple programs on a day. What is that schedule like, and, and how do you stay fresh for it? I, I would think you would really get worn out after <laughs> yeah. literally five programs a day, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, so you get to, um, the, you, we gather in the parking garage on the Sony lot down in L.A., um, and get there by 7.30 in the morning. Then there is, you know, sort of costume check, makeup, and a long kind of briefing, you know, going over the rules of the game, going over just every, every kind of thing that you can think of. Um, and then we get a snack break. <laughs> and uh, then, we, uh, then we go over to... So this is all happening in the Wheel of Fortune studio, uh, which is right next door because of COVID, and we could be spaced out there. So that was also fun, like they would be like building the sets for the next week's episode there, and you know, the Christmas one was extremely elaborate. Um, and then we'd go over to rehearsal on the, the Jeopardy stage. And so basically they, would, they had two sort of full games, uh, and we would each do half a round in one of them. There'd be four groups of three contestants. And it was basically, the first time through was like as much like the actual show as they could make it. The only difference was that uh, Jimmy, the stage manager, would play the role of Ken Jennings or whoever, um, Ken in my case. Uh, and then one more time through just to give everybody another chance to feel the buzzer and get comfortable on stage. Uh, and then they draw names to see who the first two you know, challengers are and you start the episode. Uh, and then, you know, we do that. It doesn't take much longer than the 30 minutes it takes up on TV. You know, there are some retakes and stuff like that. And when there's a judge's decision, that can slow it down. Um, but then as soon as it's done, whoever the champion was goes back to the Wheel of Fortune studio, changes outfits, gets their makeup touched up, and heads right back. Wow. Um, and then so there's a lunch break between the second and third episodes. And generally, by the end of the day, by the time the last episode was taped and any you know, final paperwork stuff was done, it would be around 6 o'clock. So it was a little under an 11-hour day most days. And how's the, how do I stay fresh? Uh, you know, I didn't entirely. <laughs> um, you know, I definitely, like, you know, I, 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 between every, any time the cameras were off, I was, like, leaning on my podium and, like, you know, stretching out my legs and stuff like that. Um, and you know, otherwise, you know, the, the, I, will, I would be exhausted. But the thing about it is uh, that, that fast pace and Jeopardy is really helpful for that because there's no time, like, to be tired when, when the cameras are rolling. So, you know, I would, like, kind of not be noticing it, and then, like, it would stop, and I'd be like, ugh, you know. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I would either, like, go back to my hotel or if I was flying home that night, go to the airport and then just, like, sit there or lie on the bed and just do nothing. Like, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't reading, I wasn't looking at my phone, just, like, completely, like, let my mind stop doing anything for a while and try and try and recover. And was there, like, obviously, they don't all air five in a day, so is there, like, a gag rule where you shouldn't be, no one can talk about who yeah. won or who lost until the air show was aired? Yeah, for sure. That's, uh, you know, we're all signed that you know, NDA or whatever about that. And uh, they don't give you the money until all your episodes have aired, which is how they enforce that. Um, so, which was also an, a funny thing because like with, uh, they, they'll pay for the, if you have to go more than once, they'll pay for your travel on all subsequent things, but you're always on the hook for a hotel or rental car or anything else. Really? Um, and so basically I was on TV, you know, nationally winning a million dollars and was also like broke. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's not bad being broke when you know you're about to be not broke at all, but it was still like just a weird feeling. Uh, yeah. So there's a, a recurring question from the media after a big win and they want to know, you know, what's next, what are you going to do next? And you did announce that you quit your job yeah. and, uh, you know, of course I want to know what's next, but at the same time I was thinking, well, had she already cashed the check? Did it go through? <laughs> do they pay you in a big check or do they pay they, you in Bitcoin or? They do, they mail you a check for wow. the whole amount at once. And so we got that check, $1.38 million. And it, it, it arrived the day my last episode was airing. And so uh, my girlfriend and I went over to a friend's house, a couple that we know, and uh, to have like a sort of, you know, rap party or whatever on the thing to celebrate, yeah. to celebrate the run. And uh, my, my girlfriend Genevieve had bought a, a bottle of champagne to celebrate. And so, and we also brought over the check just to show them because we got into late <laughs> cash and we thought, you know, we thought they'd get a kick out of seeing it. 
Uh, so Genevieve popped the champagne. Uh, it like burst out and spilled all over the check. Um, <laughs> Uh, which, you know, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't ruined or anything. It was still fine. Um, and then at the end of the night, we drove home, uh, got to, they, they live up kind of a back in a driveway, got to the bottom of the driveway and were like, did we bring the check with us? And had to turn around and go back up and get it. But next day we went to the bank, got it deposited, and it's, 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 it's good now. Phew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we actually started our, the description of this program on our website with a quote from one of uh, your defeated competitors. Um, I lost to Amy Schneider, but now I want her to keep winning. I want her to keep breaking records. I'm rooting for her with my whole heart. And as cheesy as it sounds, being a part of Amy's winning streak, even as someone she defeated, is an honor. That was Andrea Aswaje. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Other, other competitors you, you, you faced have also commented on the grace with which you have dealt with all the focus, the attention, as well as some of the negativity that you dealt with. Tell us your worldview. How do you come about to dealing with things and not... Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I, I think a few things. You know, one is that, like, you know, I definitely, like, heard that from a lot of contestants, like, you know, on the day or, like, you know, as we're exiting the, the stage. And it was, it was good to hear because, you know, I was really leading into it, like really had to manage my um, fear or whatever of what, what happens if I lose because, you know, I'd been wanting it my whole life and I knew that when I went up stage for that episode, I could be 30 minutes from the end of that dream forever, you know? Um, although as of yesterday, it looks like that may not be true and they'll be starting to let some people get a second chance at, at it, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, and so then, like, I started winning and, like, you know, pretty, you know, like, people would come in and be like, oh, she's won 13, she's won 18, and up and up. And I was like, I would have been so devastated, you know, to, to wait my whole life, get there, and then just run into a really strong person and, and you know, just not, not be in it. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've fought that feeling um, and had to, like, you know, get myself to be like, you know, heartless and competitive and like, you know, crush their dreams and all this sort of thing. Uh, but overwhelmingly, everybody like said that and, and seemed to be sincere and was really like just being okay with, with how it had gone. And so that was, that made it easier for sure. Um, and then I think, you know, in terms of like, you know, online and everything like that, um, I was bracing myself for much worse. You know, I've, I've been trans on Twitter um, and seeing, seeing what can happen to people there. Um, and, you know, I just was like, well, it comes with the territory. And uh, uh, Jeopardy had put me in touch with some people at GLAAD who had kind of given me, like, some preparation and, like, coaching on how to deal with it and all that sort of thing, which was super helpful. And, I, you know, I, I really appreciate that. Um, but then, you know, it just, there wasn't that much of it. You know, my episode started airing and like, yeah, you know, there were negative comments and it was, it was hard. It was hard to remember to just ignore them and block them and that sort of thing. I wanted to like jump in and reply uh, pretty regularly, um, but for the most part restrained myself. Um, but yeah, it just became pretty quickly clear that they were in the minority, and so that it made it a lot easier to ignore them when I was getting so much support, and especially hearing from both trans people and, and family members and loved ones of trans people of, of what it had meant to them. Like, you know, I'd put up with any number of, of trolls to, to, to have that feeling. I wanna, yeah. I want to read a response, actually. You did take the time to respond to a bully online. Oh, yeah. And I felt like, you know, I could borrow this line, and many people could. And it kind of, you showed how you could respond gracefully. Um, so here, let me read this. You said, I'd like to thank all the people who have taken the time during this busy holiday season to reach out and explain to me that, actually, I'm a man. Every single one of you is the first person ever to make that very <laughs> clever point, which had never once before crossed my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, I was very happy with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was, you know, because I, like, and, and it really, that actually, like, you know, that came into my head, and I was like, okay, this feels 
I'm not addressing anyone specifically. I'm not giving anyone specific attention, but I can say that. And like, once I posted that, that really like from that point on, I felt much less tempted to, you know, respond to or even read any negativity. I was like, I've, I've put that out there. I've made it clear that I'm annoyed or whatever. And then I could just kind of let it go from there. Yeah. So what's it feel like to be a trans uh, leader, a hero? I mean, really, and, and especially to young trans people. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, on the one hand, it's strange. Um, you know, certainly, you know, it's definitely a weird thing to hear myself described as and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, my, there's no like magical thing that happens, you know, you're just still the same person and you still have the same, you know, mind and feelings and everything. Um, so, you know, that's certainly a part of it. Um, but, you know, it's also, I'm really, you know, it's really gratifying. Yeah, I, I, I transitioned here in the Bay Area, um, and, you know, I know some trans people back in Ohio, I've got a friend in Arkansas, you know, and I'd always kind of felt a little bit of, you know, a little bit of almost guilt that I had had such a relatively easy experience with my transition, um, you know, not just in le geographically, but in, in time, that so many people um, have lived their lives without that easy path that I had. Um, and so, to you know, to, to to hear that I've actually now made a difference and and paid some of that forward of of all the work and all the sacrifice that was made before me, um, that's really really nice. Yeah. Let me ask that uh, in a different form of that question. What does it feel like to be a role model for nerds? And I mean that in the best sense of the word. <laughs> yeah, that feels good. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that like. I've, I've loved Jeopardy, and the, the things that I've loved about it are that it's, you know, it, it celebrates knowing things and kind of for their own sake, you know, just, just some, it celebrates people who are curious and want to know about a ton of different things and have a lot of different interests. And so, you know, like I, I you know, that's me. And I was glad to uh, get people excited about it and get people more interested in it because I, that's, that's, yeah, it's really important to me. Not to bring it down, <laughs> but is it okay to bring up the eight thousand dollar clue or question that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know the question of the only nation in the world whose name in English ends in H and yep. is also one of the ten most populous. Yeah. Which, yeah. What was? Yeah. Yeah. What was going through your mind? Well, you know, I somehow had this feeling that I was nearing the end. Um, you know, like, and it, it, like, I was still, like, looked like I was doing just as well on the outside, but I could just kind of feel, like, I was, I could feel my brain kind of wandering at times during the show, which it hadn't done before, and I, I could just feel like I, there was an edge that I, I was, I didn't have in the same way. Um, and I'd also, like, had a few Final Jeopardies that I lost a ton of money on. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I had kind of gotten in my head about it, you know, like during the, the rest of the game, it's just fast and you don't have time to, to doubt yourself. But like that final Jeopardy gives you like just enough time to sort of like, you know, panic essentially, which is, you know, I was really confident in the category and like it came up and I was like, oh yeah, I, this should, I, I'll get this. And then I was like, not getting it, not getting it. And then my brain started freaking out, which was not helpful. Um, and the worst thing about it is that I was hopping around the, you know, the globe in my mind and I was like, uh, India, no, Pakistan, no, well, Nepal, no, 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 move on, move on. And I was like, right there. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> do you, do you uh, just to follow up on that, do you think, it, does that question pop up like a lot now or do you think about <laughs> Bangladesh like every day? <laughs> you know, not so much. I mean, it's yeah. definitely, you know, it's, it's, you know, just like the word I missed on the spelling bee or things like that, like it, it'll certainly stick with me in a sense. Um, and like it was, you know, there was definitely a lot of like really, you know, a real sadness and, and you know, I was, I was really bummed out. You know, I'd, I'd been loving playing that game and it was like some of the most fun I've ever had. But at the same time, like that came in and then the thought was immediately, okay, but how can you be upset? Like, this is, I, you know, I thought maybe I could win three or four games, and I did ten times as many. So, like, you know, I didn't, you know, yeah, it didn't go on forever. It was never going to, you know. 
he did uh, a history-breaking job. Yeah, <laughs> John. So lots of questions here from the audience, lots of good ones, um, as well as how much taxes did you pay on your winnings? Are you planning on winning that much money? Is that, <laughs> you want the advice? Let's go to another question, though. Um, and this kind of gets into strategy. It says, it seems like women contestants bet less in daily doubles. Do you think that is the case? And does that impact why there have been fewer women who have long winning streaks? Um, you know, I think there's, there's a relation. You know, I mean, I think that when you look at women, you know, across a lot of different male-dominated fields, you know, especially like, you know, STEM-type fields, um, you know, what happens is they get pushed out, like each stage, more and more of them kind of get driven out of the profession. Um, and, you know, they're, when society tells you that this isn't a thing you do and it's a thing you're not good at, like, you have to work really hard to overcome that um, in, in yourself and, and to, to not believe it and to believe that you have every right to be there and are just as good as anyone else. And so, like, I, I think, you know, that sort of thing, especially in a situation like wagering, where you have to kind of make a quick kind of gut level decision, you know, whatever that lingering, you know, internalized doubt, you know, is going to tend to to make you be more like conservative there. Yeah. Um, you know, and so that's I, I think that that's that's what it is. Um, and it's, you know, it's a shame because like it's a society wide thing and there's not a lot to do about it except move things forward as best you can. Yeah, we can keep going with some audience okay. questions. Yeah. Well, we, we've got a number of questions that are all kind of around the issue of like, how do you, well, how do you know everything? How do you know all this stuff? <laughs> do you read everything? What books do you read? Do you, do you, mm -hmm. Are you kind of just a, an info uh, sponge on the web? How, so mm -hmm. tell us, how do you know everything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I mean, there's there's a few parts to it, and one of that is one of it is just genetic luck that you know since I was a kid I've I've had a brain that you know things stick in pretty easily. Um, you know I was like my some of my friends in school were really annoyed with me because like I never did any work and did fine, and they were you know you know working real hard and it was harder for them. Um, but I think that you know the the main thing really is you know and I've said this I know all these things because I want to know all the things you know I'm just I I'm curious about everything and learning something I didn't know before is is exciting to me and is just a, a pleasurable experience um, and I you know I think that like if I was out there like cramming for Jeopardy and studying and like going through lists of presidents or monarchs or whatever. Like, I wouldn't do it because it wouldn't be fun. I just want to, you know, whatever strikes my interest at a given time. Like, I'll regularly um, at work when I'm not working, um, we'll just kind of like go on Wikipedia and look around and look for something I didn't know and just kind of follow that where it goes and see if there's something I can learn out of it. Is there a, something that you don't know that you really want to know? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I've spent a lot of time trying to really get a handle in my brain on like what money is and how it works. Um, you know, it's like you, you, you learn these things like, oh, it's just sort of we all agree upon this value. But like, I don't know, it's a pretty it's a pretty weird subject when you think about it. Um, so, I mean, that's that's something I, I still don't fully get. I think that language and linguistics is really interesting to me, but it's so complex and it's like a really like you have to really be like a specialist in the field to really like, I, I feel like understand it the way I would like to. And it's not something I've ever, you know, felt that felt like dedicating that much time to, but it's definitely something that I'm curious about. Yeah. So you're returning for the tournament of champions later this year. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> <laughs> what do you, I mean, going into that, what do you, do you know who you'll be playing? Do you know, uh, who you're likely to face or what it'll be. Yeah, I mean, I know a few of, of the people who will be there and, you know, I don't necessarily know who I'll, I'll be matched up with and, you know, how it'll play out. But yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, Matt Amodio, who, uh, you know, whose episodes were still airing when I was taping. Um, and I was I was like, boy, he probably feels like his record is going to last for a while. And I'm, you know, <laughs> but um, he, uh, so, you know, he'll be there. Uh, the guy that I actually beat in my first game will be there, and I'm kind of looking forward to that rematch because um, he was, you know, the strongest person in my whole run, or at least the person who came the close to, closest to beating me. Um, so, yeah, and I mean, it's, it's going to be, like, it's going to be fun. It's going to be really different. You know, it's, 
it's going to be interesting competing against two other people, both of whom have been there before, have been through it, know how the buzzer works. Um, you know, it's it's going to be a different challenge, and I'm you know, uh, I'll do my best. But I'm like I you know I see people being like, oh, you're going, and I'm like, I don't think it's any guarantee that I'll I'll win or make the finals or anything. You know, I'll I might I definitely think I have a chance, but it's going to be it's going to be tough. So how will you practice or prep for? the next the next game i guess yeah i mean mostly just the same stuff i've always done which is like just going through old jeopardy games online and just going through them and looking for kind of patterns of things that come up that i'm not as strong at and, and trying to fill in those holes um like the only real thing that i've thought about that i'm going to do differently is you know i always watch jeopardy at, at home every night and uh, i'm going to going forwards when final jeopardy comes along have like you know, a Sharpie and paper or something. And like, if I know the answer, like write it down, like in the time that the contestants are. Because I think that was part of what was getting in my head was like also like, not only do I have to think about it, I have to think about it in time to actually be able to write it down and my handwriting is terrible. And you know, and it's this weird light pen on a screen. And so I think getting more comfortable with the writing part of it is really the only thing I think I'm gonna do differently. I wanna go right off on the end of that, which is, do you enjoy watching Jeopardy any more or less than you did before you became a contestant? Um, I think about the same. Um, you know, I was, you know, there was definitely, I was glad to uh, get to games I didn't know the outcome of, you know, for the first time in, the, in a couple months. I was really, I was like, yes, this is fun. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's changed the way I watch it in certain ways. And, and the biggest way is, um, I always knew this on some level, but being more aware of the fact that the person I'm seeing on stage, the contestant I'm seeing on, on, on screen, on the TV, is, is not that person. Um, and like I, I noticed it the, a game or two after the one that I had lost, one that I had seen in studio, um, I was looking at it and I was like, boy, those two, like, those two women like, look very similar, like they're related or something. And, but I had met them both, I had hung out with them all day and never thought that once or thought that they were particularly similar at all. And I thought that was just like a, a vivid example of, you know, some people I would see on screen, it's like, yeah, that's just how they were when, you know, in real life. And then others just for whatever reason come off a lot different. Um, so I think it's, it's something to, you know, just keep in mind that, that the people, you know, the people you see on TV, you're seeing a, a tiny little sliver of them and it might be misleading. So going back to the question of, and then what's next? I mean, we know you'll go back to compete, but um, what about you know writing a book? I heard that, that that's a rumor that might be something true. Yeah. Maybe possibly hosting Jeopardy? What do you think? <laughs> uh, you know, certainly uh, many people want me to host Jeopardy. That's true. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, and it's the, if they call and they were like, we want, you know, we want you to, I was like, well, I'd certainly, I'd take the call and talk about it. <laughs> um, you know, I think, and, and I've said repeatedly, I thought Ken Jennings was fantastic and like the job is his as far as I'm concerned. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would, you know, how could I say no? Um, but yeah, I mean, I am, uh, you know, trying to, to put together a book proposal and it's, it's coming along. I wrote a fair few paragraphs this morning and I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that I'm interested in. And then, you know, I mean, I quit my day job because like, I'm just constantly having people, you know, wanting to have meetings with me and like talk to me about how we could work together and this sort of thing. And, you know, all of it is extremely tentative and early, and I have no idea how any of it's going to turn out, but it's fun, and I, I want to see what's out there and, and see what, what, what might come out of it. How often, I mean, obviously you have to have a lot of confidence to have pursued this this long, to have been successful in, in, in your career and in, in, in this. When you're there answering the questions, how often were you fully confident you had the right answer, and how often were you like, uh, let's put this one in and see how I'm a little worried. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, generally, I was pretty conservative about ringing in and definitely, like, looking back on it, there were definitely a lot more times that I feel like I probably should have rung in but didn't uh, versus the other way around. I mean, I wouldn't say a lot more, but, like, it's probably a bit more of that proportion. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there were definitely times, you know, like, 
especially like if it's a short clue, you've got so little time to hit that buzzer that sometimes you've just got to, you're sort of like, I bet I know this, you know, and count on yourself like getting the rest of the way to the answer after you ring in and sometimes you don't. But yeah, for the most part, I felt if I rang in, it was usually because I felt pretty good about it. And you never accidentally rang in out of nervous energy? Uh, I did. At l there's at least once I remember where I just rang in and was like, I don't know. Like, yeah, <laughs> but um, that would have been me every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, once, maybe twice. Not not much. <laughs> you know, Steve Harvey, I think he said that if you were his daughter, he'd be super, super proud. I mean, he obviously, he's well, super yeah, proud of you'd you. have a rich daughter. <laughs> But, but speaking of game shows, I mean, are there other game shows that you'd be interested in participating in? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like, first of all, I'm, you know, contractually, I can't for six months. So, you know, for, for now, I, it's not something I have to, you know, spend too much time thinking about. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, I'd, I'd certainly be interested. I, I don't have a specific one in mind. You know, I, I feel like I started at the top with Jeopardy and, and you know, everything else is second best. Um, but you know, certainly it's a, it's a thing that, you know, people have wanted to talk to me about. And, you know, I, I, I had a lot of fun on, on a game show, so I'd, I'd certainly be happy to be in that environment again. A number of questions along the same line of, will your winnings change your life? Or how have they, or will they? You know, uh, like yes and no. Um, you know, it's, you know, $1.3 million after tax in the Bay Area, you know. <laughs> You like, get a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but I think that what it does do is it means that this, you know, all these opportunities that are maybe out there, which all of which may not happen, none of it may turn into anything, but I can give it a try, you know, and, you know, not go broke. And, you know, if nothing works out, then, you know, fine. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll have a little extra money, like, maybe, you know, part of a mortgage or something like that, and I'll just go back to, you know, tech and, like, live my life. Or move to Bangladesh. <laughs> <laughs> that seems unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to audience questions, John. Um, okay. These are a couple along the same lines. A deep question. J. Crew or Banana Republic? <laughs> uh, I, I don't have an opinion there. I'm sorry. <laughs> She no longer is getting paid for the answers, so. <laughs> A's or Giants? Um, I'd say A's, but I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I grew up in, uh, in Ohio, so like I'm a Reds fan, like for, you know, that's my team, but okay. yeah. Well, you answered some of this before when you were talking about like what you're on the dock for paying your own uh, uh, hotel during the <laughs> tapings. Is, what, was that a theme for like food and, and travel or what? Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they provide lunch. Um, and, and it was a really nice lunch? Um, well, so until the last week I was there, like it was, we ate lunch in the parking garage and it was like a little, you know, kind of catering tent set up and they like, you know, wheeled the boxes of kind of pre-made food in. And like by that standard, it was, it was fine. It wasn't terrible. They also gave us uh, a cookie with every lunch which uh, I never ate at lunchtime because I was always like b very conscious of like eat a light lunch, don't get drowsy. Um, but at the end of every day I would eat it and it was fantastic. It was a great cookie. Um, and then, but then at the, the, like the last week I was there, we were finally allowed to actually go to like the, the commissary, the Sony commissary or whatever. Um, and that, that food was really good and I wish I had gotten there sooner. Um, but <laughs> we, we did still have to take it back to the parking garage to eat it, however, so yeah. What advice would you give your younger self today? Um, you're a woman, uh, I think would be number one. Um, but I think, you know, and I think, but really like is sort of what's more, the, the sort of deeper thing under that is like, don't be afraid to show your whole self and to bring your whole self into whatever you're doing. Um, people will like it. <laughs> like, I know you don't think so, but people will actually like you fine. And everything you do will feel so much more rewarding when you know it was like really you doing it and you don't feel like you were kind of faking your way through it. Can you talk a bit more about what was your childhood like? What was your family life like? So, you know, I was um, raised in a, you know, pretty conservative Catholic household. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, like we were essentially the most liberal ones in our parish, so I didn't really realize how conservative it was, you know. <laughs> 
like my cousins, like their their parents went through everything, every book or anything, and like like whited out any reference, you know, not just to like sex or, and, and stuff like that, but anything related to magic or, or anything else. They had uh, they had the Star Wars trilogy, which uh, they had edited because the Force counted as magic. So they'd edited out all references to the Force. And so it'd be like, in The Empire Strikes Back, like you, Luke is like, okay, we're going to Dagobah. And then the next time you see him, he's like, okay, we're leaving Dagobah. It's just like, <laughs> wild. Um, so yeah, so I mean, that was that. And then I think, you know, the other main thing is that, um, you know, my parents were both, you know, like intellectual people. The, my mom was a math professor. Uh, my dad was a computer programmer, um, worked at the University of Dayton. Um, and they both, you know, really believed what my mom would always call it the life of the mind. And it was, you know, it, it was sort of about education, but it wasn't about grades. They didn't care what college I went to, anything like that. It was just about for its own sake. It's worth it for itself. Um, and so I was just raised with that and, and encouraged to pursue that from, from childhood. And then what about coming out to your parents? How'd that go? And then coming out as a nerd and then becoming <laughs> a Jeopardy champion. Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, my, my dad passed away uh, a couple years before I came out. Um, and that one would have been tough for a while, but I'm confident that it would have worked out in the end. Uh, my mom was basically fine. I think, you know, like, like for most trans people, there's at least some people close to them that are kind of like digging their heels a bit about, you know, name and pronouns. And it's, you know, it's perfectly understandable that the people that you're closest to are also the people who have the longest habit in their brain of how they refer to you. And so they can be the slowest to change, which can be, you know, difficult, but it's just human nature and it's not, you know, it doesn't, you know, she was like, she was accepting of it from the beginning. She wasn't, you know, upset or anything like that. And it, it pretty quickly like became, you know, perfectly smooth. And, you know, she started calling me her daughter and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, and then I don't, oh, uh, yeah, and the Jeopardy thing. Uh, yeah, she's delighted, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what can I say? You're right. So your winning streak was snapped by a librarian from Chicago, mm -hmm. who's also part of the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> what, I mean, talk a bit, if you would, about the role that Jeopardy, this, this institution in this country, plays when it comes to normalizing LGBTQ lifestyles and humans, mm -hmm. humanity. I mean, I have to say, as I think about it, and I, I ju I, this just occurred to me like the other day, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure the first like um, time I saw a gay man like that was, you know, not, it, it, they weren't a caricature on a TV show, they weren't anything else, that they were just kind of a person was on Jeopardy, like the, you know, people, you know, casually mentioning their, their boyfriend or, or things like that. Um, and, you know, I, that, I think that, that they've always had, I think, a pretty, you know, they're pulling from a population that is very cis white male, you know, of people that are really into trivia and would, would, would want to try out for Jeopardy. Um, but they've always worked hard to show as, as diverse a set of contestants as they can, and I've, I've, I've always seen them doing that. So, you know, even when I didn't feel like I could be okay with myself on Jeopardy, I always knew that they would be fine with it. If I was there and I was smart enough that they would put me on and, you know, no questions asked. And I think that's just really wonderful of them. And I think it, it you know, is in keeping with their, the, the sort of ethos of the show. I mean, I think that, to, if you know a lot of stuff, it means you have that kind of curiosity and that drive to learn, and that is usually going to include wanting to learn how things are in other people's perspectives, how other people see things. And so I think that people, you know, Jeopardy fans are, you know, yes, they're an older demographic, there's no doubt about it, uh, but I think that, you know, you shouldn't take that to mean that they're not open-minded because like I think for you know for the most part you know relatively speaking they they are and they're they're really open to you know to to whatever well yeah I mean American everyday American uh, households and families have fallen in love with you <laughs> yeah and and I hear from many folks who are here today have said that they tuned in every day just to see you right yeah, yeah. yeah. And so to, to add to that, you know, what kind of responses were you getting from, you know, your new legion of fans? Like, <laughs> do you get questions about being transgender? Do you get, 
what kind of comments are you getting? Yeah, I mean, you know, not really like questions particularly, you know, I mean, and that's, I mean, that's what's the beauty of it. Like the people who, you know, I mean, apart from, again, the handful of, of, of haters, um, the people who reference my being trans are for the most part people who are trans themselves or, or have some, a trans person in their life and, and talking about it, how it affected them that way. Otherwise, it rarely is any aspect of, of what they say. And that's, you know, kind of unexpected, but really wonderful. And it's really like, I realize that, you know, you, you, you see the news and the headlines and, you know, the bills being passed and this sort of thing. And I think I had underestimated, you know, just how fast the progress in, in our society as a whole has been, um, even like, even over the last five years, let alone longer. I'm hearing noises. I hope other people are too. Um, so you mentioned a book. Is there anything you can tell us about? Do you know? I mean, I assume nonfiction or what yeah, do you want to say? yeah. No, I'm not just gonna bust out a murder mystery and be like, aha. <laughs> um, now is your time to finally write a magic book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I say, it's all still kind of in gestation or whatever. But the basic idea is, you know, there was a couple kind of essays I had written during my Jeopardy run that I was that I was pretty proud of. And so it's going to essentially, I would imagine, be like a collection of essays as a format, um, you know, which I want to do because like, you know, like my run on Jeopardy was really interesting and I want to talk about it. And being trans is really interesting and I want to talk about it. But like there's a excuse me, there's a lot of other stuff I want to talk about, too, um, you know, that's not, not even just about my life, but just about, like, you know, the, the ideas I have and things I find interesting and, like, you know, why I think the TV show Daria is so great and whatever else. And so, you know, we'll see what actually ends up kind of making sense together, but I just, I like that format because it allowed me to, like, kind of go in a bunch of different directions and, and play with different things that interest me. What other things interest you besides Daria? <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, some kind of, there's some kind of philosophical stuff that like partly just coming out of transness and then thinking about identity as a whole. I think about, you know, like language, how, how imperfect it is. And, and that really comes from being a computer programmer. You know, I, I tell people that writing software is, is an act of translation. You're taking a human being and said, I want it to do this. And when you tell it to the computer, you have to unpack all the hidden assumptions and unstated like you know requirements that go into it that as human beings we can just sort of take as given but computers can't um, and so like that's you know in my job I'm constantly thinking about what does what do people actually mean when they say anything and so that's that's definitely an idea that, that I'm really fascinated by that's gonna be a great book <laughs> <laughs> So you're now recognized on the street, I assume. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Uh, it's it's pretty fun for the most part. I mean, it's like, I re, you know, I, I remember like one of the not the first time, but like one of the like first four or five times. Um, you know, I got recognized like twice in Safeway when I was there on, on you know on one trip. Um, and I was walking out. And I was like, well, this is really fun. And I was like, if this ever stops being fun, I'm not going to be able to like turn it off. And so that was a, you know, a, a sobering moment a little bit. But that said, like, I'm still enjoying it. It's just nice to like see people just so happy. I'm like, I'm, I'm just, you know, again, I'm just shopping, but like, hi, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what about the like the selfies and the, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I definitely get a lot of that. I went to, when I got my, my booster shot, um, it was at Kaiser and there's sort of the, like waiting area that a bunch of people were there and like, you know, people gathered around uh, quite a bit. I, I took a bunch of selfies there and in almost, I would say a good 50% of the time when I take a selfie with someone, they're like, thank you so much. I'm going to send this to my mom. She loves you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like m moms are my demographic. It would seem. <laughs> Judging by the uh, audience and looking, yes, you're right. No, John. Um, okay. So someone writes, as a trans woman and someone who occasionally finds herself in front of many people, I am always conscious of my voice, the sound of her voice. Did you make a decision on how your voice you wanted to sound? Absolutely. Um, you know, and that was that was a big thing. I have 
I had, you know, dysphoria about my voice, you know, being uncomfortable with my voice and how it sounds has been one of the bigger things that I've, I've experienced since transitioning. Um, and I, you know, did like some vocal therapy and I, I you know, if, you know, and I, it's, it's maybe faded a bit, but like if I try to, I can put on a pretty passably feminine voice. Um, but I hated it. I hated doing it. I felt like it felt like it was putting this barrier, but you know, every time I was speaking that I was having to route it through this like character or something I was playing. Um, but my plan, my intention had been on Jeopardy that I was still gonna, that I was gonna put on that voice. And I'd been practicing it um, and all that sort of thing. But then like just a few days before taping, I just suddenly, I was just suddenly like, no, I can't, I'm not gonna do that. Um, I, it just, A, it would just be one more thing to think about and I'm trying to minimize those. But then B, like I just realized, you know, like this is a thing that so many trans women, you know, struggle with this feeling. And I can be on, on TV having my voice, you know, having my, you know, my woman's voice that this is. Um, and, you know, I knew how much that would have meant to me to see that. And I couldn't, you know, I, 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 I had to give that to, to other people. Mm. Yeah. Want to go on with some more? Well, audience actually, why, why don't we? Because this is kind of related. Yeah. Um, we talked about your you as a trans role model. Do you feel the the pressure to represent all trans people, and how do you deal with it? If so, and uh, they write and a heartfelt thank you for being yourself from a fellow trans nerd. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's it is pressure. Um, it's like it's not overwhelming or anything. You know, I. I think the biggest favor I did for myself, you know, not knowing that all this was going to happen, the biggest favor I did for myself was to make a conscious effort to be as natural and authentic as I could be on TV during Jeopardy. Um, and so because I did that, you know, I I don't feel like there's a persona I have to keep like inhabiting because um, that's what people expect now. I mean, I think, you know, like certainly I, you know, it's my public self. Uh, I'm more careful about swear words and casual references to my past sexual history or things like that. Um, but you know, it's still pretty much me. Um, so that that eases the pressure a fair amount. But that said, you know, like it definitely. I knew that being on Jeopardy in particular, like many people, is going to be their first kind of sustained exposure to a trans person, and not not a not a trans person playing a role in a show, but just an actual trans person. Um, and so definitely I wanted to, you know, to, to, to represent us well, to, to, to not give anyone any reason to be confirmed in any like suspicions or doubts or like dislike that they might have had. So, you know, I will see how it goes. There's definitely a feeling of like, what if there's a scandal? I don't know what the scandal would be about, but what if there's a scandal <laughs> and then let everybody down? But like, I, I, I keep it under control. It's not that bad. No. <laughs> Do you have a last question? Because I want to ask the last question. Well, I do, and it comes with a comment, and that is, I mentioned we do a, a zillion programs here at the Commonwealth Club, and we'll continue to do them on all, every imaginable topic you, you can imagine. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for allowing us to do a program about a wonderful person having this wonderful run, uh, representing yourself and others so well, and you're not trying to overthrow the government or uh, you know, any of the other millions of negative things that we sometimes have to cover. She um, might be, we just don't know it yet. <laughs> that would have been the scandal, of course. <laughs> she's, she's avoided that. But uh, I mean, thank you for that and mm -hmm. the opportunity for us you're to welcome. share this with you. I know that you had mentioned before that uh, you know, the, the trans part is, you know, it's just a part of the whole Amy package yeah. and the superpowers that you have. But I do want to acknowledge how huge it is that you are representing yourself and our community and then also making an impact in American households. And so if you could leave us with your last thoughts or words, especially for parents who have transgender children, um, people who are tuning in, who are learning about transgender lives for the first time, if you could leave us with some 
some words of, mm -hmm. of advice and support? Yeah. I mean, I think I'd say, you know, a few things. One is that, like, uh, you know, as I, as I hope I made clear, like, being trans, like, is not a big deal. Um, you know, if, if somebody you know is transitioning, like, it's, it's a huge deal for them and it's an important moment in their life, but they're not going to change very much. And you're going to quickly see that, like, they're the same person they always were. And, it's, and, and the other thing that I want to, you know, would tell people, and, and this is something I've er, I heard a lot, you know, especially parents and grandparents of, of trans people, um, is not to worry. Um, you know, like, I don't want to say, like, it's all, you know, everything's good now, trans people have no problems, because um, they definitely do. Um, but, you know, I, I hope I've, I, I, and I know that I showed a lot of people that being trans did not, as I feared it would, keep me from, you know, this dream I had. Like, and so what I would say to anyone, especially, you know, people with trans people in their lives, people who are trans and early in their transition, is that this doesn't close off anything. Anything you've wanted to do, you can still do and probably do better at um, as, as a trans person than, than you could in the closet. And so, you know, just, just go for it. Everyone, Amy Schneider. The next time, um, card, Amy, to write my questions, I do really want to know if we got the bigger bathtub. <laughs> got the bigger Not yet. Bathtub. Well, we're, 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 we've got our eyes on some. <laughs> well, we look forward to the next time you are on television. We look forward to more of your awesomeness and your amazingness. We look forward to the new book. And uh, thank you so much for being a super light our Bay Area sh uh, hometown Shiro <laughs> and everything you are. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We want to thank all of you for being here with us today at the Commonwealth Club of California. Thank you for being members of the club. Thank you to all of you who joined us online. Thank you to Trans Clinic for supporting this program today. And back to you, John. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> Be safe.